Oh, take your Bibles this morning, if you would, please. Let's start out in our place. First uh, Corinthians chapter 10, if you would, please. First Corinthians chapter 10. Let's start in our starting place in this series. I will eventually get back to uh, the Ten Commandments, but some things that uh, God has just impressed upon my heart um, that I would, I would just like, if, if this was the last, if this was the last sermon series I ever preached in this world, I think this is the one that I would probably pick out. I want to leave something behind for people, to, to show people things that I personally have learned um, in, in my walk with the Lord and understand that just because uh, somebody's a preacher that does not mean that that they live automatically a higher life a better life uh, they that God calls the good guys to be preachers um, that's not how it is God if you look in the Bible God did not hide the sins of the various people in the Bible uh, from our view. We know the sins of Noah. We know what he did wrong. We know what Ham did wrong. We know the sins of Moses. They were made plain and written out for us. We know that Moses was a sinner. We know the sins of David. We know the sins of Solomon. We are told in the Bible that Elijah was a man of like passions as we. And yet he prayed one time and it didn't rain for three and a half years. So over and over and over we see the, we see the sins of Peter. The doubting of Peter. Cursing there uh, when, before the cock crew the third time. We know the mistakes that Paul made. We see Paul getting into a very heated argument with John Mark. Uh, so much so that Barnabas had to intervene between the two. Uh, and so the Bible doesn't hide those things from us. It tells us that these men and these women in the Bible, Sarah, what was the, what was the spiritual condition of Sarah when the Lord was standing there and he was saying that he's going to bless her with a child? She laughed and then when questioned about it, she lied. And yet God blessed her anyway. What was Samson doing just prior to him prevailing against the Philistines by taking the two iron gates and placing them on his shoulders and prevailing against them outside the, the perimeter of the city wall? He was in, he was in the house of a harlot is what he was doing. Delilah was not his wife and yet he was sharing a bed with her and his spiritual condition, he was, he was a sinner. And yet God, by grace, through faith, used these people. And so I've learned and had to learn over the years or I wouldn't be here today. By the, by the way, I've been meaning to do this. Uh, we have a man back here, Jason Chan. Where are you from, Jason? From Illinois. I'm so sorry you're from Illinois. Ron and Sandy comfort him after church. They used to be from Illinois. But he's been following our ministry for years, and it's uh, good to have him. He's going to be, you're going to be in town for what, about a month, something like that? So anyway, it's good to have him with us this morning. But anyway, um, I, I've got it. God has forced me to, to understand, Mike, you are not going to get out of this life without living by my grace and by my mercy. Because I've prayed, God, make me better. God, make me right. God, make me holy. Make me to where I don't sin no more. Don't want to sin no more. Don't, don't even think about it anymore. God, make it to where I don't want to do that anymore. And God has said, Mike, you are not going to leave this life without living by grace through faith. Because that's how I save people. In other words, you can count on the fact that I have made many mistakes in the past. 
You can count on the fact that while I'm still human, I will continue to make mistakes in the future. I don't want to. I want to avoid them as much as possible. But it is not going to be possible for me to be right 100% of the time. And these are the trials of our faith. These are the fiery trials that we go through. And I'm using that particular language for a reason. So I want my, I, I, the first sermon that I preached in this series, if you didn't figure it out then, I'm letting you know now I preached it to my family first. My family first. Because if I save all of Kenya and lose my family to the devil, what will I have gained? Now, I love the people of Kenya. I love the people of this church. But I'm sorry, I love my family. And I'm also sorry for the fact that they turned out just like me and their mother. And their grandparents. Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Didn't say that rock was a symbol of Christ. Didn't say that rock was a metaphor for Christ. It said that rock was Christ. And I just believe the Bible. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And my question, my question to the people who are in this church house this day, and to those of you who are watching online, which one of you will God overthrow five years from now, ten years from now? Which one of you will God wipe out? Which one of you will he do it to? There are people who are not in this church this moment who used to be in this church, but God overthrew them. They could still be here. They could still be sitting in the pew next to you. They could still be reading their Bibles, saying amen, singing the songs, enjoying the fellowship, feeding from the Word of God. But with them, God was not well pleased. And they were overthrown. Verse 6. Now these things were our examples. So... To those that you've seen God overthrow. To those that you've seen fail in faith. Turn their back on the Lord. And then reap the consequences of that act. Learn from their mistake. Do not make their mistakes. That's why God lets you see that. Do not make the same mistake that they made. And so why did... My, my, I remember clearly me and my mom sit down for lunch one day and she said she was going to be teaching a lesson on David and something like that. And, and she said, you know, you read the Psalms, you read the story of David. Why do you think David went through all that stuff? Why did he have to go through all that stuff? And I said, Mom, you're reading about it now, aren't you? Yeah. You're fixing to teach on it, aren't you? Yeah. I said, that's why. God let David go through these bad, terrible things, being chased, being tried to kill, be killed by Saul. The mistake that he made with Bathsheba. The house that splintered after that event. His own son trying to have him killed and dethroned. All of those things were written for our examples. 
and then the life of Solomon and all the mistakes that he made and all the women that he had and all the wine that he drank and all the parties that he had and all the money that he had and everything that he had. God let him have all that but retain his wisdom. So he writes down the book of Ecclesiastes at the end of his life to tell us I had all of this and it was a big mistake. I wish I'd never had it. I wish I'd never gone this way. I wish I'd never done these things because they were vanity. And if you can avoid them, avoid them if at all possible. Avoid the mistakes that I've made. Son, don't do what I did, in other words. So he says, now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as were some of them as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. He said they tempted Christ. Christ was there. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. And they were all written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth. See, that's pride thinking. Pride thinking says, well, I'll never make those mistakes. Pride thinking says, I'll never do what they did, bless God. I've got a little bit more fortitude than they've got. I've got a little bit more strength than they've got. Let me tell you about a preacher I know. By the name of John. I won't give his last name. My mom knows who I'm talking about. At one time I considered him a mighty, mighty man of God. Mighty preacher of God. Pastored several churches with, with some success. Was able to bring in new converts. Preach revivals all over the country. Had a, had a powerful presence about himself. He was a dairy farmer and lived a country life. Raised his children right, homeschooled them, raised them to in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Seemed to be God's holy man. A couple of years ago, the, the men of the church where he was pastoring knew what hotel room he was in with his mistress. They went to that hotel room knocked on the door, had a box of his stuff from his office, set it down at the door when he opened the door and they said, don't bother coming by the church. We will box up the rest of your stuff. We'll have it taken to your house or wherever you want to, but you're done being our pastor. How dare you do this to us? And that man, that man of God, Never repented. Blamed his wife. Blamed his adult children. Got into it with, his, with one of his sons over the deal. His son said, Daddy, why did you do this? And he went, went to blame him. Then he blamed his mother. And that just, that just drove a wedge between him and the, the, his whole family. And then followed that woman up north. She moved up north and he followed her up there. To this day, to my knowledge, never repented. The Bible says of the strange woman, many strong men have been brought down by her. So if you think that you've got so much in you that it'll never happen to you, you're fixing to fall. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Father, we ask your blessings on this message. I need help to preach it. Father, I've been guilty. This is why I'm preaching this. I'm preaching this to let people know I know exactly what all these are. I've been through them. God have mercy on me. God have mercy on your people. God have mercy on my family. God have mercy on husbands and wives and families. Father, we're trying to home educate our children. We're trying to teach them in the Nurture and admonition of the Lord and the world is just swallowing them up the moment they get loose out of our out of our grip, out of our hands, out of our 
hold over them. The world just chews them up. And God, I pray, Lord, that one young person, one young man, one young lady will listen to this message, listen to these messages and take heed. And God, that you would give them strength to withstand in all these evil days that are coming to them. It's guaranteed it's going to happen. God, would you bless our children? Would you bless the younger generations, Father? That they may not make the mistakes that their mom and dad or their grandparents made. But God, that you could have a generation of young people, a holy generation, a royal priesthood. Father, help us as parents, help us as grandparents, help us as elders to live a life in front of them, Lord that teaches them grace and mercy and faith and that if they fall God can pick them back up and, and a church a church God can have mercy on them and pick them back up dust them off and say we fell too now let's go let's me and you walk together hand in hand into the gates of heaven together we'll help one another God help us to be a helping church Helping one another. Helping our brothers and sisters. Encouraging one another. Even so much the more as we see the day approaching. God, help us to be that kind of church, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, here's, remember the deal here. Here is, here is uh, uh, Egypt. This is where we came from. This is where we were in bondage to sin. This is where we were drinking. This is where we were doing drugs. This is where we were sleeping around. This is where we were cursing and telling dirty jokes and had a mouth full of lies. And this is where we were stealing from the company and stealing from this and stealing from the government and stealing from that. This is where we were in bondage to sin, bondage to pride. This is the land where we thought where we weren't doing anything wrong. And that we can make our own way to heaven. And God, God broke us. God broke our backs down with heavy labor. God God put the burden down on us and we decided we couldn't take it anymore and we cried out unto the Lord and God heard us and God saved us and God brought us out of that land. But in, in the course, he didn't, just, he didn't just walk us right out of Egypt and right into Canaan land. We had to go through these issues of life. Mount Sinai, the waters of Meribah, the gainsaying of Kor, the rebellion of Kor, I preached on that. Now I want you to take your Bible, turn to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. Do you believe the Bible this morning? You believe these stories are real? You don't think they're fables, myths, do you? Because if you do, you're not going to get anything out of it. You're not going to believe it. And there ain't no sense in you hanging around here. There ain't no sense in you listening. If you're not going to believe it. And I want to encourage you to believe it because it's true. Every bit of it, every word of it's true. This, especially this part here, is part of my testimony. Where I complained and found distasteful the bread that God was trying to feed me with every day. And I'm talking about this King James Bible. I went, because I, 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 when I was 16, I came to this altar here. Preacher Golf had preached, Must Jesus bear his cross alone? It's based on the hymn, Must Jesus bear his cross alone? And all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. And God began to deal with my heart that night about the cross that I was to undertake. And I came down, Preacher Golf came down, prayed with me, Mike, what are we praying about tonight? I think God's calling me to the ministry. Well, let's pray about this and let's, let's tell the church this and have them pray for you and we'll, we'll set you aside. If I would have known then what I know now, I would have never, would have never come down to that altar and undertaken that cross. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the burdens of the ministry. I'm not talking about how hard it's been sometimes. 
I'm talking about if I would have known the sin, the rebellion, the disobedience, the faithlessness that I would have wandered into later on in life, I would have never surrendered to preach because I would have said, I'm not going to dishonor God that way. So I did what I thought everybody should do. You get out of, you get out of high school and they counsel with you what college you're going to. Well, I'm going to Bible college. Ended up going to two of them. And from both of them I heard and was taught that all the Bibles are wrong. Every Bible, even though at the time, at the time, we were all using King James, both colleges, they were telling me in the Greek class, they were telling me in the other classes that Bibles were not translated correctly, they were wrong, and some of the, some of the things you could question and doubt that they really happened, did, it really, did Jesus really say it this way? Are these words right? There's a, there's a variant here and probably one, of these, probably one of these places here in 1 Kings is wrong and learned all that stuff. So I found myself coming out of Bible college disregarding and disbelieving the Bible more than what I believed it. Pastor at a church down at Richwoods came here went through the mess that we went through. Some of you remember that back in 95, 96. The mess that we came through back then. But by the grace of God, God brought me back. And I'll tell you what happened to me. I got bit by that serpent. I got bit by that fiery serpent. And I almost died. And God saved me from it. Numbers 21 verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Now I want to tell you, quit watching Joel Osteen. Quit watching Joyce Myers. Quit watching TBN. Quit listening to most Christian radio. Quit, quit that garbage. They're going to tell you that Christianity is a life full of roses and happiness and joy and praise every day and you should have a smile on your face every day and everything's going to go your way. You just have to proclaim it and don't have negative thoughts and this and that and the other. And I'm telling you, that's a lie. And when it doesn't happen in your life, they will sit there and tell you it's your fault. You're doing things wrong. You're, you're, the re, you're rebelling against God and God hates you. God can't do anything because you think in negative thoughts and, and all of this stuff and tell you it's your fault. And that brings discouragement to people. They think, how come they're getting all the goodies and I'm not getting anything? And then the devil shows up and says, you are not good enough. You never make it. You might as well quit. You might as well drop out. Raise your hand if he's told that to you before. Raise your hand high if he's told you that before. I have. He said it to me. Mike, you're not good enough. Mike, you'll fail. Mike, I'll expose you before everybody. And then everybody will know who you are. They'll throw you out of this place. The people was much discouraged because of the way. Nobody ever tell you that it would be a life of roses. Nobody ever told you that it would be an easy life. Nobody ever told you. God never told you that. Jesus never told you that. But he told you that I'll be with you all the way. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will hold your hand. I will take you. I will carry you if I have to. I will lead you gently as a shepherd leads his sheep. You'll follow me into the gates of glory. I'll make sure you get there. No man will ever pluck you out of my hand. That's what Jesus says. And the people spake against God and against Moses. You know who that is, don't you? See, it's going, it, this, everything's always about the Bible. You speak against, you, you start listening, you start listening now to the radio preachers, the TV preachers, the internet preachers, 
the social media people, the Facebooks, the YouTubes telling you, man wrote the Bible, there's mistakes in the Bible, the King James is not right, what you need to do is go to another translation, it'll say it better than others. That's what they're going to tell you. And when you are discouraged, and when you are, when sin has entered into your life, thorns growing up choke out the Word of God, and all of a sudden now, you start believing that garbage, like I did. You start believing it. Well, maybe the Bible is wrong about this. Maybe, maybe, maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't, maybe, maybe it is okay to be a sodomite. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it is okay to live together without marriage. Maybe it is okay for me to have, have a drink at night every now and then. Maybe it is okay for me to smoke medicinal marijuana. Maybe, maybe that is all right. Maybe it's okay for me to not go to church anywhere. Maybe I can just do it on my own. He's going to fill your head with all kinds of rebellion against God and, and tell you that God, God's not really on your side. God's not favoring to you. God, God really won't help you through this. You can, you gotta help your head, gotta help yourself sometimes. And they said, wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. They were talking about the manna that God sent down from heaven to them as a gift. Every, they, I'm talking about the miracle bread that came from heaven itself dropped down on the ground every day. They never saw it come down. They just woke up the next day and it was there. And they went out and gathered it up. And it, it, what's wrong with it tasting like honey? I mean, you got me right there, amen? It tastes like honey. You gotta give me some more of it. But they let their friends, they let the devil, they let their sin loathe the light bread the bread of light and all of a sudden in fact let me just ask you this and everybody here should know the answer to this when you first start getting cold against God and turning away from him what's the first thing you stop doing Always. Let's think about why. Because the devil has told you and you believe. If I read this, I'm liable to believe it again. And my flesh just wants out. I want out. I want to quit. I want to give up. Listen, you will not be the first person to ever leave this church to go back into sin. My mom has been here, I guess, as long as anybody has. And she's seen since 1974 this person leave this person leave this person leave and it was all over they went back to their sin didn't they mom complained about reading the Bible complained about believing the Bible decided not to believe the Bible decided to not use it as part of their life just turned their back on God's Word walked away from it like I did only I was in the ministry. Now you try that one on for a while. 
And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now, fiery serpents, some commentaries will tell you that it was be, those were just normal, everyday, regular serpents that when they bit them, it burned the skin. It felt like there was a burning there. That's, that's not it. These were not regular serpents. The Hebrew here is seraph nachash. Seraph is where we get the word Isaiah 6.2. It's where we get the word seraphim. What is a seraphim? What are the seraphim? Gary, what are the seraphim? They're angels. And you know what they're made out of? Fire. He made his angels, spirits, his ministers, the flaming fire. So it literally means angelic type serpents. Evil angel serpents bit them. Now do you think that modern medical science has a cure for spiritual snake bites? There is no medical cure for it. Even Isaiah 14 talks about rejoice not thou whole Palestine because the rod of him that smote thee is broken out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent In Deuteronomy chapter 32 let me show you this for a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn into the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains you see, it's always when God gets angry, fire shows up. And he said, I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spin mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. And I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. God said that when, I, when my fire gets kindled and when I get angry, this is what I do. I send my arrows upon them and I send poisonous serpents against my people who will not listen to me, who will not yield to me, who will outright rebel against my word. And let me tell you something. People are guilty of it. Churches are guilty of it. Whole denominations are guilty of it. Bible colleges and seminaries are guilty of it. And I would say a vast majority of what is referred to as modern Christianity in this world today is guilty of speaking out against the Word of God, this light bread. So God said in Psalm 58, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born. Speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They're like the deaf adder that stoppeth their ear. Now notice what this verse is doing for you. It's connecting ideas. And he says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born. And they speak lies. So what is the poison of the serpent to us today? It is false doctrine, false gospels, false Bibles, a false spirit, a false Jesus Christ. And speaking lies is the poison that affects us when we start getting hold on God, when we start complaining against God, when we start getting wanting to go back into sin, when we start saying, I'm not, I don't want to read that Bible anymore, that thing, I can't figure that thing out anyway, it's too hard for me, or I don't like what it says, or I, you know what, I read on the internet the other day that this whole chapter was probably wrong anyway, and I, in fact, one, one lady said that she got freed, the Holy Ghost freed her, because she found out that really, that she what happened to my projector? That she could live however she wanted to live and, and, and I believe that. That's the way I believe now and I'm living with my boyfriend and, and we're okay in God's eyes. That's a lie! 
And you'll end up believing it. You'll end up believing it. Now I got to get I got to get that screen going back. So give me just a minute. No wonder it changed Wi-Fi on me. Did it shut off? Did you say you turned it off the whole time? That's just like the devil. Here I am getting to the getting to the big part, and he steals my fire right out from underneath me. While I'm waiting on this, let me ask let me ask all of you a question. Who in here would be brave enough to raise your hand and say, Yep, Bethel Church, I went through a time where I rebelled against God's Word and I didn't want to read it, didn't want any part of it. I got one, two. Boy, I love honesty in a church. And I, and I mean that. I love honesty in a church. Because with honesty comes salvation and grace. You believe that? Say amen. Now if you really believe it, say amen. There. Psalm 140 verse 1. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. They have... Sharpen their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. There was a man in the church I pastored down at Richwoods. In fact, his father was a deacon in the church. He was also a Freemason. And uh, he used to like go out and get drunk all the time. Well, he got him a new wife, and there was something about me that they liked, so they started coming to church, and I, re I remember one Sunday morning, we, was just singing the, we were just singing the hymns, and all of a sudden, him and his wife came down to the altar, and I thought, man, I didn't even preach yet, and we got people coming to the altar, and I, I prayed with them, dealt with them, and they wanted to get things right with their, with their marriage and they want to get things right with God and come back to Him, rededicate their lives and so on. And Man, I'll tell you what, it was just a, just a joyful service. Amen. Praise the Lord. Boy, look what God's doing here. God's cleaned up sin everywhere. About six months later, I was teaching Sunday school class and he said, uh, I, I don't know what I was, I forgot what I was saying, something about I don't know what it was, but he just threw his hand up, and I said, yeah, and he said, I believe the Bible says you can do anything as long as it's in moderation. Now, what was he talking about? Drinking, right? Everybody figured that one out real quick. I talked to his mom and daddy, and... They said, yeah, he's going to his brother because he had a brother that wasn't in church. He's come to me. He's come to his dad. We both told him, no, you can't have any of that stuff. He went to his brother and his brother said, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. So finally I sat down with him one time at his house. And he said, I don't believe there's anything wrong with me coming home after a long day's work and Drink me a little wine or have me a beer. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I said, but it won't stop there. And with you, it won't stop there. It'll, keep, it'll just keep on going. And guess what happened? He became a meth cooker in that county. That's where it went to. The devil lied to him. He liked the lie more than he liked the truth. 
and fell for it, and you will too. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. What is that poison? Romans 3 verse 10, as it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And you can go out of this church and find people all over Festus and all over Jefferson County and talk to them and start and bring up church and they'll say, I'll never go to a church again as long as I live. I went to a church and half the people in that church were drunks and I knew it and the other half was sleeping with the other half and the preacher was going after teenage girls. I'll never be part of that church ever again. Their mouth got full of cursing and bitterness. And here's the lie. Genesis 3. Turn your Bible there. Here's the poison. Don't ever believe this poison. Please, I'm begging you. I go around the country... And churches ask me to come and usually they want me to preach on this. They want me to help confirm. Brother Ron Dagonia, he had a, uh, it was Rose's cousin. Rose has got some cousins down there. They're three brothers, Barry, Daryl, and Daryl. Barry and his brother Daryl and his other brother Daryl. They used to be drywall hangers, and I knew them. Ron called me, and he said, Mike, he said, you remember, you remember Daryl? And I said, yeah. And he said he had visited a church, and they had a special preacher there. He was preaching on the King James Bible. And he come back and asked Ron, he said, Ron, why don't you ever preach on the King James Bible? And he said, well, he said, I know a guy. So he called me. And they will ask me to come and just give to that church assurance that they're doing the right thing by holding on to the King James and not letting it go and not going over to a new Bible. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. That's poison. Because you have family members and you have people that you work with who go to some other church. Or you have people on your Facebook feed who say, well, our church uses the NIV and we're just as saved as everybody else is. Our church uses the, the, the Holman Standard. That's the Southern Baptist Bible. The Southern Baptists had their own Bible. There's nothing, and all it did was take out the these and thous. You King James people, you worship an idol. You worship the Bible. You better believe I do. And your friends are speaking serpent talk. Yea, hath God, did God say this? And then he said in verse 4, Ye shall not surely die. That is a direct contradiction of what God said. Ye shall not surely die. And then he introduces a brand new doctrine that is his own and it did not come from God. He said, for God doth know, which was a lie. God never said this. This is not part of God's doctrine. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods. Gods are immortal. Gods can live in the heavens. Gods can fly. God can do all kinds of things. And I'm going to tell you something. There is a day coming when the gods are going to descend from the heaven. And they're going to spread lies all over this world and people are going to believe it. Will you? You will. 
if you loathe this light bread. God will release. Watch, look at this. This happened uh, last year. Men film glowing snake-like UFO in the sky before chasing it down as it disappears. Fiery flying serpents. This is an actual photograph. This is not Photoshop. This is not, this is not fakery of any kind. This is a group of people out in a desert area chanting, emptying their mind, performing transcendental meditation type practices where they empty their mind and they're calling out to what they think are extraterrestrials. Actually what they're calling is devils. They're calling in familiar spirits. And a guy took a photograph at this exact time and what he captured on film was a fiery flying serpent. I saw this in the documentary and I, I, my jaw dropped. Had to have it surgically put back on. Here's a close-up of the woman's head. Do you see a fiery flying serpent there? It is unmistakable. This Bible's right. Listen, I told you, I asked you, did you believe this? Do you believe this story? Do you believe that God released fiery flying serpents on those people? You better believe he did. And what he did with these people, he released them on these people. You know why? Because they were calling to devils. And devils showed up. They loathed the Bible. They refused the Bible. They rejected the Bible. And God sent them serpents. And the man who ran this event, Dr. Stephen Greer, said that this person actually had what's called a kundalini experience. It is an enlightenment experience where now his third eye has been opened and he can see things that he can he's had an experience now with Satan himself but he doesn't know it that way and he's had his consciousness altered now probably permanently in kundalini the yogi reverses the searchlights of intelligence mind and life force inward through a secret astral passage the coiled way of the kundalini in the coccygeal plexus, that's your lower spine, and upward through the sacral, the lumbar, and the higher dorsal, cervical, and medullary plexus, and the spiritual eye at the point between the eyebrows to reveal finally the soul's presence in the highest center in the brain. It's just another way of saying that they've been sealed by Satan himself. Now, is there forgiveness? Is there forgiveness? Everybody say yes. Look at Numbers 21 verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord. That's what I did. That happened in 1998. 20... Three years ago. And I have repented. I won't say every day. But often. I have repented all over again. For ever doubting God's word. I am so sorry. That I ever did that. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man which he beheld, the serpent of brass, he lived. That's the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. 
Because Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God, Read this out loud with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And I want to say to every young person, those... 80 years and younger. Every one of you. And those online. The day you leave mom and daddy's house is day one of the devil trying to talk you out of believing God's word. Josh Duggar grew up in a Christian home. Was taught the Bible every day. Read the Bible every day. Supposedly, I'm assuming, had godly parents teaching him in the way of the Lord. And now he's facing 40 years in prison for possessing child pornography in his office computer. Just because we try to raise them right and teach them right and guide them right and whip them right, not always a guarantee that the devil can't get to them. Let's pray for our children. Let's pray for our grandchildren. That they learn not to speak against the bread of light. Let's bow our heads. I want you to pray for Josh Duggar and his family. That man has got serious issues. Can God forgive him? Yep. Father in heaven, we come before you today. And Lord... There was absolutely nothing wrong with how my mom and dad raised me. They did everything they could. But God, there was lessons that I had to learn. And you knew, God, that I had to learn them the hard way. My mama's faith wasn't enough to carry me through in my life. I had to have my own faith. And Father, my wife and I realized years ago that our faith was not going to be enough to carry our children through. That they had to have their own faith or they were not going to make it. And I pray, Father, for my children, my grandchildren, And for the children in this church and these parents who are trying to protect their children, raise their children right, show them right from wrong, train them in the way that they should go, knowing 
just how dangerous this world really is and that one of these days their children are going to go out into the midst of it. And Father, I've, I've spent the last few weeks visiting churches where people were telling me, pray for my son, pray for my daughter, pray for my children. Pastors, pastors whose children are not living right, adult children are not living right. And that just breaks our hearts. Father, our children need help. If they're ever going to make it, they're going to need help. Because at some point, they may turn against this bread of light. And sure enough, you'll, you'll turn the serpents loose. And if they don't come to you in faith, trusting in your salvation, God, they'll be dead forever. Father, help our children. Help our grandchildren. Help us as adults to live in a way, Father, that exhibits the grace and the mercy. Help us, dear God, to not hide our mistakes from our children and our grandchildren. But teach our children and our grandchildren that we also make mistakes. We also sin. And we must then turn to God for forgiveness and mercy and grace. And you'll always give it to us. Help us to teach, Father, by our example. Bless the young people in this church. Bless the young people, Lord, listening online. And all their families, dear God, who are trying to do right. Trying to teach them the right way. Children, Father, who love to watch. Pastor Mike on, on the internet. Father, bless them for that. But God, help me to never bring disgrace to your name in their eyes. But to encourage them always. Keep standing for the word of God and keep believing it. Their faith is going to be tried the moment they get out away from their mom and daddy. And Father, we just pray, dear God, that we have trained them sufficiently to where they can still stand even if they've fallen. Bless your word this morning. Bless your people this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet?